This is another great message by Pastor Nathan Bemis. It's called Holding Forth the Word of Life. An old sermon from all the way back in 1986. And it's just a great message reminding you to stay in your Bible. Keep putting out the Word of God. And spend more time in the Bible than you do all this other stuff that people are so caught up in doing. You know, when you get to the judgment seat of Christ, is God going to look at you and say, how come you didn't read my word? You know, what have you done with the word of God? So listen to this great message, and you can take this message, give it to your friends, put it on your channel. You know, this is the Lord's sermon. You know, anything you do for the Lord, it's the Lord's. You know, there's no copyright on this. You can take it. You can put it on your channel. You can give it to your friends. You can make a copy of it, give it to somebody. You know, if it's if you're doing something for the Lord with the right motive, you want as many people to see it as you can. So listen to this message, and I pray that you'll really get something out of it, and it'll get you back into the Word of God. There's no satisfaction in riches or in fame If our Savior is denied Every castle tumbles and life's a broken dream With 
without Jesus by our side. Thirty pieces of silver was the price they gave. Thirty pieces of silver just the price of a slave and my heart I have given to this Christ betrayed and I know just how much he loved me by the price he paid. From his ivory palace he came to such as I, but I scorned his love for me. Sold him in for the silver of things that I regret. Sorrow, plain and agony. Thirty pieces of silver was the price he paid. Thirty pieces of silver just the price of a slave and my heart I have given to this Christ betrayed and I know just how much he loved me by the price he paid. Take your Bibles this morning and turn to two places. <clears throat> if you will, turn to Isaiah. Take your Bibles and turn to the book of Isaiah, chapter 55. Amen. Isaiah, chapter 55. And... Turn to Philippians chapter 2, verse 16. Turn to the New Testament verse. Uh, there's a corresponding passage in the New Testament with Isaiah. And uh, that is Philippians chapter 2 and verse 16. So let's read the two verses together. <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 55 and let's read verse 11. Verse 11. And it says... So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please. And it shall prosper in the thing whether into I send it. Now take your Bibles and turn to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, and let's see the corresponding passage in the New Testament, which says, Holding forth, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, nor labored in vain. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray this morning that you just wash my mind. And Father, I pray that you'd just fill me with the Holy Spirit this morning. And I pray that you'd help me to preach and teach your precious book today. May it be a blessing and a help unto everyone that hear it today. And Lord, if there's somebody here this morning that's never been washed in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, Father, I pray that you would show them their great need of the Lord Jesus Christ and their great need of salvation. I pray today would be the day of salvation for their soul. In Jesus' name I pray, and for his sake, amen. Now the two passages, one in Isaiah chapter 55, verse 11 says, So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. Now that's the Bible, that's God's book going forth. 
All right? It shall not return into me void. It won't come back to God. Then when the word of God is put out and sold and sold, it's going to come back to God. But it won't come back void. It shall it shall prosper in the thing whether into I have sent it. Then God sends his book out and it's going to prosper and it's going to prosper where God wants it to prosper. You know what we do many times? We think that it ought to prosper where we want it to prosper and it's going to prosper where God sends it out. You know there's some things in that Bible that's very difficult and very hard and very uh, uh, coarse and very hard for people to receive. The other day I was down preaching on the street corner and Sean come by and Sean said, Preacher, there's a uh, one of the business been down here in the street corner stopped me and put me on the spot and said, you guys out here preaching on the street corner with that microphone and yelling and screaming and hollering and telling everybody they're going to hell is uh, hurting my business. <laughs> and you're driving people away and you're doing it the wrong way. You know, I got to thinking about that and praying about that. You know what I come to the conclusion of? I come to the conclusion that God's book sometimes takes a man and drives him and takes and cuts him and hurts him and drives him for a particular purpose. And sometimes God calls preachers to stand up and tell people they're going to hell. That's right, and sometimes He calls Christians to tell them to go, they're going to hell. Do you know how many verses in the Bible tells a man he's going to hell? You ever study the verses in the Bible that talks about men dying and going to hell without Jesus Christ? That Bible's plumb full of verses of Scripture telling people they're going to hell. So it's my job. You know what I do? I'm going to stand up on the street corner until the Lord comes back, Lord willing, by the grace of God. And I'm going to put my hand up in the air and stick my Bible up over there and I'm going to say, you're going to hell if you're not saved. You know something? I'm going to tell you the same thing this morning. You're going to hell if you're not saved. You say, what do you mean, preacher? God said, whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. If you've never been saved, you're going to hell. Now, that's a purpose that God has sent His book out. He sent out going to pray for a purpose. Now, uh, the Philippians chapter 2 and verse 16 says, it says, uh, holding forth the word of life. Holding forth the word of life. You know what that's talking about? That's talking about the Bible. Putting the Bible out. How many of you Christians take and put the Bible out in a gospel tract and hand out gospel tracts and put gospel tracts out and hand Bibles out? You know what that is? That's holding forth the word of life. Now, you're not going to win everybody. You're not going to win the whole world. But I'll tell you something. When you put the book out, God, the Holy Spirit, will take and use the Bible when you put it out. You put the Bible out, you got the handful of tracts, every Christian ought to walk out the door this morning and get him a big handful of gospel tracts and start handing them out. And putting them out. You say, what for? So you can bring forth some fruit in the judgment seat of Christ. Look at Philippians chapter 2 and notice in verse 16 again. It says, Holding forth the word of life. That, why should you do it? Why should you put out the Bible? Why should you preach the Bible? Why should you minister the word to other people? That, I may rejoice in the day of Christ. What's the opposite of that? What's the day of Christ? The day of Christ is Jesus Christ coming back and that's the judgment seat of Christ. And that's where you're going if you're saved. All right, what did it say? It said rejoice. Rejoice. Then brother, when you preach the Word of God and teach the Word of God and put the Word of God out and witness, you know what you're going to do? You're going to rejoice at the judgment seat of Christ. Amen. Now uh, brother, keep on putting out the book. Keep on putting out the book. I mean, you may have problems and you may have sorrows and you may have heartaches and you may have uh, bills up to here and you may have sickness up to here and you may have a thousand other things. But keep on putting out that book. Keep on putting the book out and putting the book out. Why? So you can rejoice in the day of Christ at the judgment seat of Christ. I'll tell you something. If you don't put up the Bible, what's the opposite of rejoicing at the judgment seat of Christ? Christ. And it's going to mean many a Christian is going to borrow and cry at the judgment seat of Christ because he didn't put out the book. You know something? Uh, Gideons. Have you ever heard of the Gideons? How many of you have heard of the Gideons? Alright. Uh, you know what the Gideons do? The Gideons go out and buy them a bunch of Bibles. And boy, I wish I could become a Gideon. 
They won't let preachers become a Gideons unless they change it between now and then. But for some reason or another, they won't let preachers become one. I've had a dream, and I've had this dream more than once, that I was a door-to-door Bible salesman. And I was going down the street knocking on doors and selling Bibles. And I dreamed in the middle of the dream that every door I knocked on, I give a Bible away. You say, that's more of a dream? That's more of a dream. That's more of the reality dream. You know what I want to do? I want to put that book out and put that book out and put that book out. You say, why? Because it won't return into God's void. Amen. It'll accomplish something. You say, but preacher, with some folks who reject it. Yeah, they will. Yeah, they will. Some people will just say, I don't want the Bible. Don't you preach that stuff at me. I was on the street corner and I had my hand cupped and I said to one lady, You're going to hell! The Bible says, Whosoever not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And this was her. She was in a Cadillac. <laughs> she got out of her Cadillac and she looked down the road at me like that. And then she looked real strong and I gave her the verse again and she went, Nah! <laughs> Like that at me, and got back in her Cadillac and drove off. You know, I thought to myself, "Okay, sister, you're going to the judgment too. I'll see you there." And you say, "Preacher, what are you doing?" Some folks reject the Bible, reject the Bible, turn the Bible down flat. So I don't want nothing to do with the book. And you'll have plenty of that, and the word of God will fall on deaf ears. You can preach this book and preach this book, and it'll fall on deaf ears, and people won't hear it. You know, some you got to have an ear for the Bible. You know what? you got to get an ear for it. You say, preacher, I can hear better than you can. Yeah, but you ain't got an ear for it. See, you say, what are you talking about? I was talking about a spiritual ear. You ever meet a Christian that come along to the Bible and they say, oh, that's the Bible. Yeah, yeah, it's a dull book. And I don't understand it. What does it mean? I ain't got any idea what it means. And, oh, that's the Bible, but I haven't got any idea what it means. No, that's just a book. You know something? That's the greatest book on the entire world. Amen. That's a book that changes a man's life. That's a book that will make a thief in bronze man. Make an adulteress into a pure woman. That's a book that will take cussing and swear out of a man's heart and put a clean mouth in him. That's a book. You said that's a book that will take you from wearing no clothes to putting on clothes. That's a book, brother. That book will change you. It's changed some of you. That book is such a book, it'll change the look on your face. It's true. When you start getting into it. Amen. Start reading into it and start getting into it and start meditating it and memorizing it. I'll tell you something. You give me your life and I get you in that book and start putting you in that book and ten years from now I look at your flesh and I don't care who you are, you won't look the same in your flesh. Amen. Amen. You get out of that book and don't spend no time in that book. Ten years from now, I look at your face. I look at that face and I'll say, that's a different face. And I look at some faces this morning. I look across some of your faces this morning. I wish I could see you ten years from now if the Lord tarries. Oh, the difference you would look. You wouldn't be the same person and your face wouldn't be the same. Don't be it. Don't be it. I'll tell you something else. If you stay out of that book, if you stay out of that book, ten years down the road, I'll look some of you people right in the eye, right in the face, and I'll say, she hadn't been in the book. All oh, that change took place in that face. And it'll show right here. Right around the mouth, right around the eyes, right around the face. Show all of you. He said, preacher, I'll put a smile on. Uh-uh. You can put a smile on and it won't be there. You can show your teeth and say, look here, I'm happy. <laughs> and I'll look right between them eyes of yours, look right in your eyes. Some more of that face. You can't imitate it for all the money in the world. I would never been able to imitate what that book will do to your face. You sow the book and sow the book and sow the book and then it'll come back. And you say, preacher, why should we do it? <clears throat> why should we do it? Why should we hold forth the word of life? Number one, found in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. Take your Bible and turn to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. Why should you hold forth 
the Word of Life. First Peter chapter 1, and look at verse 23. And it says, Being born again, not by corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the Word of God. Is it a small W? By the Word of God, is that a small W or a capital W? Look at it again. Look at it again. How many of you say it's a small W? Okay, that's what it is. It's a small W. You say, what is the difference? What's the difference between a capital W and a small W? The difference is this. A capital W is found in John chapter 1 verse 1. The capital W is found in John chapter 1 verse 1. Now look at that. Keep your hand in 1 Peter because I want to go back to a minute. But in John chapter 1, it's a capital W. It says, in the beginning was the what? Word. Is it a capital W or a small W? Capital W. Capital w. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word, capital W, was God. Amen. Amen? Amen. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Then who is the capital W? Jesus, Jesus Christ. This is not a capital W found in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. What is it? A small W. So what's it talking about? It's talking about this book. Amen. This book I got in my hand. This King James 1611 A.V. Bible. That's all I got in my hand. I don't have good news for modern men or the Amplified or anything else. I got an old King James Holy Bible. You say, well, it's just a thing. I had a bunch of pages in there. Because <clears throat> I ran out of room where to put stuff. <clears throat> I marked it, marked it, marked it until I ran out of room and I didn't have any more room. So I stuck a bunch of pages in between it so I'd have more room. You know why? Because I believe that's holy. That's holy. You say you're a Bible auditor. Why, well, a Bible auditor wouldn't write on his Bible that much if he was a Bible auditor. Why, well, if he's a Bible auditor, you know what he'd do? He would stick it in a box and never open it. And never touch it. And never wear it out. I'm no Bible artist. I have no worry about it. But I'll tell you something. I believe it's the words out of God's mouth. I believe it's the words out of God's mouth. And every word in it. Every word in it. You know why you ought to put it out? <clears throat> First Peter chapter 1 verse 23. I didn't finish reading my verse. <laughs> First Peter chapter 1 verse 23 says... <clears throat> Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but by incorruptible. By incorruptible. Uh, which, uh, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God. Small Libya, there it is. Which, what? Liveth. liveth. What liveth? Word. What's alive? What? Man, alive. You mean to tell me that book is a lie? Amen. Why, I thought it was just a book. It's a lie. It's a living book. Tell me any book in the library of America that is a living book. That Bible's a living book. Why, you say it's dead, preacher. It's just a bunch of paper. It's just a bunch of words. See, it's a lie. You say living, living. I'll tell you something. You get, let's say you get to be about seventy years old, and Lord willing, you all get there sooner or later, or maybe even eighty, and your mind starts to slip on you. And it will, brother, if you stay around here long enough, it will slip like that. Anybody been around here long enough for your mind slipping? Come on, thank you. Oh, see, you're only twenty. <laughs> you know something? You know what you're going to do? You're going to go down that road and then you're going to open up the Bible and you're going to say, Preacher, I can't remember a thing. And you're going to read down through there and read down through there like that and you're going to say, I can't remember a thing. You're going to read down through there like that and read down through there like that and read down through there and you say, Man, I can't get nothing out of it. It's a lie. Keep right on reading it and you don't memorize nothing. It's a lie. It'll do some point. When you get in and your mind's gone, Spend time in the book because it's different than any book on this earth. Amen. You say, I get something out of it, you get something out of it, you walk away and say, I don't remember what it said. Don't make any difference. It's a lie. It has an effect 
that no book in the world has. You say, what does it do? It comes off the page and gets on you. Comes off the page and gets on you. Say, preacher, you believe that? I don't believe preaching as I didn't believe it. Amen. Say, so you believe every word in it? Every word in it. I can't read every word. But I believe every word. I can't spell every word. But I believe every word. So you change it? I wouldn't change it for all the money in the world. Why? My life and my soul is at stake. My soul is at stake. I'm going to give you money for it. I'm going to believe just like it is. You say, why should you put it forth? It says in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 23, being but not of corruptible seed, but uh, but by the Word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. You know why you ought to preach that book? It, because it's a living book. It brings forth life. One of the greatest things that a woman can experience is bringing life. Amen, ladies? Tell me something. Am I right? I'm a man, you see. I don't know those things. Am I right? The greatest thing, you ladies that have had children and brought forth life, you tell me if I'm telling you the truth. The greatest thing is to bring forth life. Tell me something. If that will bring forth life, make a man live, and it won't put him out. Amen. 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 And it won't put out. And back it up the man that does put it out. And stand it up for the man that wants to put it out. And help the man that's going to put it out. Are you putting it up? Are you putting it up? Why a man ought to hold forth the word of life? Because it's a living book. Man, you know something? I never had a baby. But I'll tell you something. I can give life. I can give life. I can reach in my pocket. Bring out my New Testament. I can bring a man from death to life. I can give him the new birth. Woo-hoo! I can give him the new birth. By that book. Amen. Amen. By the book. Uh, number two. You ought to hold forth the word of life because of Psalms chapter 119. Take your Bible and turn to Psalms 119. And in Psalms 119, I want you to look at verse 105. Psalms 119, 105 says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. A light unto my path. Now look at that book. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet. And a light into my path. You know why you ought to hold forth the word of God? Because it gives light. Not only does it give light, but it gives light. How valuable is light? Have you ever stopped to think about how valuable light is? Take away your light. You blind that eye. You blind that eye. Take away all your light this morning. See how valuable light is. You say, but preacher, I could do this and I could do that. No, I could do this. And a blind guy got out on a golf course and hit a 30-foot putt. He was blind. A 30-foot putt. Man, I can't hit a 30-foot putt. And he gets behind the guy and skis down the hill at 45 miles an hour. Blind as a bat. Skiing down the guy hill at 45 miles an hour. Pretty good for a blind fellow. Tell you something. You can't see a sunset. Can't see a sunset. Can't see a rainbow. Ever seen a rainbow? I was driving down the road one day, seen a rainbow. That rainbow must have been 20 feet apart, 20 feet from the ground. Rainbow reached out there, 20 feet long, little rain coming down. I thought to myself, oh, how peaceful, how beautiful that rainbow is. I drove in my car and that rainbow just went right along beside me. <laughs> you was with me when you showed up. Just rolled out of that rainbow, I just, I just about drove off the road playing that rainbow. <laughs> how pretty it was. I said, take your Bible, write something down. So I was like, I said, the rainbow is this color, the rainbow is this. He wrote for about 10 minutes. I got you, and I thought, man, blind man, let me see that. How important is life? I'll tell you how important it is. Put all the light out! And put a little bit of the old light way over here in the corner. Come in this building at night, put all the lights out, put the moon behind the clouds, walk in this building. I can get around these views. But I bet you can. Yeah. I bet you can. 
I've walked through this building so many times I can come in here without knocking over stuff. But you can't, you hit that pew, you hit the altar here, you hit that pew there, and you'd probably fall down before you got through the door. How about you know it's like? The other day I was underneath my trailer fixing my water. It's dark under there. And I had a hole in there and I was putting the pipe up there. There was a hole in the pipe. And water was coming out that pipe. I had my hand up there and water was running down that and running down my neck and running down my shirt. And I was in mud up to here. And the bolt and I had a bolt up there and all of a sudden that bolt up on top of that thing dropped off and dropped down in the mud. And my kid and my flashlight fell over. I said, oh, help me. I got that great. I grabbed that flashlight and I said, Thank the Lord for a flashlight to find a bolt in the mud. Come and put the bolt on without a flashlight. See, how important is that? Gives a man how to walk. Thy word is a light unto my path. Try and go through life without that book. And guide you one step at a time. One step at a time. He said, Lord, where do you want me to go? This book will tell you where to go. This book will tell you how to go. It'll tell you which way to go. It'll tell you when to go. It'll tell you where to go. I go right there. Thy word. It's like a light. How valuable is a light? More valuable than anything I know. Plenty valuable, brother. See, how valuable is a light? Come in the house at night. Flip on a little bit of light here by the, by the bed. But the children are sleeping. You see how much difference it makes. They ever raise any kids? Go in the kids' bedroom. Go in there and flip the light on. How the children just go to right and sleep. Come in that same room, put all the lights out, make the house as dark as it can be, and have just as dark as the we could see your face in front of you and watch the kids just get nervous. Get nervous. Never try it? Try it sometime, don't believe it. Come in there, just put a little light light on the wall there, just click a little light about that big, click it on. Watch that comfort and peace come over the soul and over the heart and over the mind. Light is valuable. Light is valuable. You ought to put it out and you ought to hold forth the Word of God because of John, uh, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26. Take your Bible and turn to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26. Ephesians 5, 26. Now look at the verse. This is why he ought to hold forth the word of life. Ephesians 5, 26 says, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word. Might wash it and cleanse it by what? The washing of what? By what? You know what this book will do? In washing. So when you get in here and you start reading in Genesis and you're reading Genesis and you're reading over there in Second Chronicles and you say in Second Chronicles so and so begot so and so and so and so begot so and so and so and so begot so and so you know what's happening? God's cheating and he's washing you. Cleansing you! So how important is it to be clean? When I crawled underneath that trailer I had cobwebs in my hair I had mud in my hand. I had water from head to toe with mud out of my And I come out and I thought to myself, how would it be if I couldn't take a bath? I went hunting once. And I went out there and hunting and there was no shower out there. I was out in the tent. And Monday I had no shower. I take two showers a day. Sometimes three. If you don't believe me, ask my wife. <laughs> I was out there Monday and I didn't take a shower Monday. And I my beard started to grow. And Tuesday I didn't take a shower Tuesday. And I brushed my teeth and that was about it. <laughs> and Wednesday I, I washed my hands. And man, when you skim three or four days, you got blood from here up to I mean man, you got blood everywhere. And everything's blood. And you wash that off and clean your hands. And one night I was out there beside the fireplace and I just got through cutting some meat. And my brother cooked up a hamburger. And I didn't even wash my hands. Still had the blood on my hands. And run over and grab that hamburger. And I thought, oh, if Louise could see me now. <laughs> and when that week could go by four days, I had a beard that grew way out here like this. 
and I could, you didn't want to stand too close to me. And downwind, no wonder so many deer got away. Man, I could smell you about four or five miles downwind, you know. I mean, I went and took a shower in the motel that night. And I got cleaned up and I thought, I come out of there and I thought, Woo! Man, do I feel good! Brother, put it out and 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 put it out. Again, take your Bible and turn to Acts chapter 20 and look at verse 32. Acts chapter 20, verse 32. Why you ought to put the Word of God out? Acts chapter 20, verse 32. Now look at the verse. Acts chapter 20, verse 32. Acts chapter 20, and look at verse 32. And it says, and now, brethren, I command you to God and to the word, word, word of His power, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. Underline it. Which is able to build you up. Build you up! You know what this book will do? It will build your soul. It'll build your spirit. It'll make something out of you. If you spend time in it and meditate in it and love it and put it out and read it. Build you. You ever build anything? A friend of mine got an old piece of steel and cut him out a knife, cut him out of shape of a knife, then took that thing and took it over on a grinder and polished it and polished it and polished it and polished it. And polished it and then he took and cut it down, took a file and file and sharp edge on that thing. And then he took him a piece of wood and made him a handle out of that thing. And then he made a sheet for it. And he said, Preacher, that thing is worth 260 bucks. I sold it, you know, the amount of hours I got in it. But I'll give it to you. I said, Well, thank you, Dave. Appreciate that, brother. You know that beautiful knife? Hours and hours and hours of work. You know something? That took something to build that night. You want to build your soul? Want to build your soul? Spend time in the book. Spend time in the book. Shane, you go out there and you put a log and you cut a thing and you put a log and you cut another notch and put a log and cut another notch and you build a great big old house two stories high. Did you do it in two days? Nope. But when you got through, you stood back and said, Man, that's nice. How many of you have ever built a house? Anybody ever build a house? Well, there you go. You know what you, when you got through, you said, Ah, oh, praise the Lord, that's good. Make you feel good, didn't it? I'll tell you something. That book right there, I'll build you and make something out of you and build you on the inside. And when you get through, you can stand back and God say, he built it to the book. I wonder what your soul looks like on the inside. I wonder if you're a little shack with the windows all knocked out, and front door hanging off, and, and looking on the inside and she says, hey, I don't want to live here. You know what Billy Matt does? He goes into his house and he looks around and he says, man, I don't want to go somewhere but here. And then he goes. Then the wife cleans the house up and makes you look spick and span and makes you look so nice and he comes home and says, Ha ha! I like to say around here, right? This is where I want to be. Yes, sir. You know why? Because it's a good place to be and it's a nice house. But that thing is nowhere to be. You know the wife's the same way. She comes in here and she says, Man! This thing is a terrible mess! I don't even want to be here. 
and cheap they do. <laughs> amen and amen, brother. You folks know I'm telling you the truth. You say, what about the Holy Spirit? I'll tell you, the Holy Spirit comes and the Holy Spirit's inside you and He says, Man, look what I can do. Look how much I'm enjoying. And they have the Word of God building them and building them and building them and building them. Look what I can do on the inside. And they just build and build and build and build. Some of you got a, a roof guy and it's made out of hay. It's made out of straw. It's made out of mud. <laughs> and you haven't spent time in a book for years. You, but you say, Preacher, I can sure talk spiritual. Sure, you can talk spiritual. Man, nah, that nah, doesn't nowadays. You got the most spiritual talk of anybody I've ever met. You say, Hallelujah! Pray the Lord! Go to me! And you ain't spend time in the book for months and months and months and months. Don't kid me, man. I know what you look on the inside. And your mouth won't make the, any difference one way or the other. I know! I'm a preacher! How much time you spend in the boat praying over it, and reading it, and memorizing it, and hiding your heart. He said, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Another reason why you ought to hold forth the word of life, and that is found in uh, first, uh, Second Peter chapter 2, verse 12. Peter? No, I mean Second Timothy. That's the one I want. Second Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. That's the one there. I'm getting it now. 2 Timothy 3, 15. Take your Bible and turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. In verse 15 it says, And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures. Are they holy, folks? Amen. They're holy, brother. Don't let nobody kid you. Don't let nobody take them away from you. The holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto what? Salvation. Salvation. I'll tell you why to hold forth the word of God. Because he said, From a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation. Are you teaching your children the Bible? If you don't, it might damn them. Do you get what I just said? If you don't, it might damn them. Said from a child, thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are wise to make thee wise unto what? Salvation. You know how a man gets saved? He gets exposed to the Lord. That's right. why you say, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by what? The word of God. Now you, you say, what'll it do? It'll save a man's soul. That's what it'll do. Every man that I've ever met. And a man in this building this morning, this morning again, I'll tell you what brought somewhere in your life you was exposed to the Bible. Maybe there was a, a space between that. Maybe there was six months. Maybe there was a year. Maybe there was five years between then and the time you got saved. Maybe there was 20 years between then and the time you got saved. But somewhere he was exposed to the Word of God. That's great. Maybe Mama sent you to church. And Daddy sent you to church and you was brought up in a Sunday school. And you memorized this verse, you memorized this verse, you memorized this verse. And exposed yourself to the Bible. You know what it'll do? I'll say to my soul. Brother, don't you ever get tired of putting out that book? May they come in that rescue mission and go out that rescue mission door and say, laugh at you and say, hey man, that's not for me. And five years down the road, the Holy Spirit will say, I said, what should I talk to the man who should gain the whole world to lose his own soul? One day I was out here knocking at the door. And the lady come to the door and I said, you need salvation. She said, I've always been saved. I'm always a child of God. She said, I, I don't need none of that. I'm just good. I've always been good. And I said to her, they that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. She said, where'd you get that from? I said, Jesus Christ said that to the scribes and Pharisees because they didn't need salvation. They that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. You know something? If you believe God's book, 
and believe that book, you can come to know Jesus Christ as your Savior. You can find Him today. And you say, how, preacher? Jesus died for your sins on the cross of Calvary. He was crucified. He was nailed on the cross to save your soul from hell. If you'll turn to Him today, God will save your soul. Amen. You say, preacher, it's that simple? That simple. You can't save yourself. You're a sinner. You're not good enough. But He can save you if you'll trust in Him. All eyes closed and all heads bowed. And Christians prayed this morning. My text this morning says, Holding forth the word of life. Holding forth the word of life. Christians, are you memorizing it? Are you hiding it in your heart? Are you putting it out? Do you have a ministry of giving the word to somebody else? Do you have a heart to give it to somebody else? Put it out. Put it out. Put it out. Put it out. You say, preacher, I can't put it out. Can you can uphold somebody else it is then. You can support somebody else it is then. You can take care of somebody that's given their life to putting the word out. You know what I'm doing on the street corner? I'm putting the word of God out. That's what I'm doing. I'm putting out the book. You know what I'm doing in the jail? I'm putting out the book. I'm putting out the book. I'm putting out the book. You know what's going on in these nursing homes up here? Three or four of them around town? Putting out the book. Putting out the book. Putting out the book. You know what's happening over the radio station every Sunday night? At 9.30? I'm putting out the book. Putting out the book. Putting out the book. Now let me tell you something. What are you doing? What are you doing? You say, but preacher, I'm not a preacher. I'll tell you what you ought to do. You ought to memorize the Bible. You ought to memorize verses of Scripture. You ought to read the book. And you ought to meditate in it. And you ought to tell your friends about it. Is there anybody here this morning who preacher, I'm saved. I know I'm saved. I know I'm God's child. And I know I'm going to heaven when I die. Can you raise your hand for the word of testimony? Amen. 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 Now, is anyone here who said, Preacher, I don't know that I'm saved. I don't know that. But I'd like to know that. In fact, I know I'm not. And I'd like to be saved. Would you raise your hand and say, Preacher, pray for me. I know I'm not saved. But I'd like to be. Would you just raise your hand, put it up this morning, and put it back, back down again? Is there anyone in the congregation at all this morning? Say, Preacher, I know I've never been saved, but I'd like to be. Pray for me. Would you put your hand up and put it back? Is there one in the congregation at all? Is there any? Is there any? Now, maybe there's a Christian here. Say, Preacher, I've been saved more than a year, but I've never read the Bible from cover to cover. And by God's grace, I'll start reading it. And by God's grace, I'll read it this year. Would you raise your hand and say, Preacher, pray for me that I'll read God's Word this year. Amen. 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 Is there enough? Say, Preacher, pray for me. I've been saved more than a year, but I've never read God's book from cover to cover. Pray for me that this year I'll read it. Is there enough? Is there enough? Amen. Amen. Is there enough? Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that every hand that was raised here this morning, Lord, I pray they'd go home this afternoon. I pray they'd go home and and get to the place by themselves where they can meditate in your precious book and read it, Father. And Lord, go through the hard part. Some of it's dull, but some of life is dull. And Lord, there's a reason for it. Lord, you just didn't put it in there for no reason. There's a reason and a cause by everything you got in the book. And, Lord, where we don't know the reason, Lord, we believe it. And, Lord, may it change our hearts and our lives, Father. And, Lord, every hand that was raised this morning, I pray that by your grace and by your mercy, that they would be able to read from Genesis to Revelation this year, Father. And then when they go home to the judgment seat of Christ, they say, I read it. And, Lord, help them to study it. You said, study to show thyself to prove unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And, Father, help them in these matters. And, Lord, maybe there's been some Christians here that you just kind of gotten away from it and kind of got slack. And maybe there's someone here this morning who said, Preacher, I read the Bible through before, but I've just kind of got slack in reading it and kind of got backslidden in reading God's Word. And I just kind of fell away from it. And, Lord, I, I Preacher, will you pray for me now that I'll get back in God's book and go back to it again. Pray for me. Would you raise your hand? Maybe there's one like that. Amen, amen, amen. Is there another? 
Is there another? Is there another? Amen? Amen? Is there another? Dear Heavenly Father, <clears throat> I pray this morning that every hand raised this morning, I pray you'd help them to, to do what they said they'd do, Father. And Lord, help them in this matter. And Lord, help them to put it out to others. In Jesus' name I pray, and for His sake. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand. Take your hymnal and turn to the page. 375. 375 in your hymnal. <clears throat>